human beings are, if not angels, uh, then agents of angels on earth, but only if they can make the choice to, to be that manifestation. Welcome back to Mind Matters, everyone. Today we are going to be doing another show on Zoroastrianism and its prophet Zarathustra. The, in last show, we talked a bit about the history and a bit about some of the ideas, and we're basically just going to be talking about some other pieces of the history and some more ideas today. Some of the things, maybe going a bit more in-depth into some of the things we talked about last week. Um, I want to give a bit more background to the kind of environment in which um, scholars have kind of um, identified as the, the, the ground in which Zoroastrian, um, the Zoroastrian religion grew and developed. So one of the interesting things about Zoroastrianism is the texts themselves, because they were only written down in uh, like the first century and were probably oral oral traditions before then because the earliest the the earliest sections of the text the the gathas are in an ancient form of persian that has no um, no previous written language so there's no inscriptions in this ancient um, persian language um, which is called named avestan and when this was first discovered and when the texts were first translated in like the 1800s, they, the, the people working on these texts realized that the language was very similar to the ancient Indian languages like Sanskrit. And to the point where if you read two sentences, they're almost identical. If you know one language, you could read the other one fairly, fairly easily. It's almost as if they were um, dialects of each other. So the Indian language, the Sanskrit language, was the one used to compose the ancient Hindu text, the Rig Veda. And so we have these two ancient texts, um, one, of, um, one of which is, or w was discovered and was in this ancient language that no one was really familiar with at the time. So this led to a lot of linguistic discoveries too, to, to see that these languages were part of the same family and probably came from a, a common source. So this helps develop the Indo-European hypothesis, basically, that all these languages um, can trace back to a common source. And th with the Hindu and the Zoroastrian texts and religions, you can see that they came from the same source, the Indo-Iranian um, culture. So there are several theories about when this happened, two main ones, and the one um, we talked about a bit about that last week, but in the with the genetic evidence, the it seems that probably I don't know if it's like two or three thousand years ago was the was when the um, the the people working on genetic histories think that the the Indo-Europeans came down from the the steppes, so the 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 area kind of north of the Caucasus and in that stretches out to Central Asia, but the the more European end of the or western end of the Caucasus of the, the steppes. And that whatever culture and religion existed in these peoples was the one in which um, Zarathustra grew up and which he reformed. So the way that M. L. West in the hymns of Zoroast Oh no! Actually, no. Wrong book. The way that uh, Kroatchek, Paul Kroatchek, in this, *In Search of Zarathustra*, which we talked about last week, the way he described the existing religion was like this. In any case, the old religion had been too tainted by association with a rigid, caste-bound, and despotic monarchy. Its priests too obsessed with enforcing the pettifogging details of correct observance. So that was what Zoroaster, Zoroaster or Zarathustra was combating. And it reminded me of a similar uh, prophet and reformer of religion, and that's the Apostle Paul, because he basically had a similar message with, uh, with reforming from within his own religion, the religion in which he grew up and, um, and, the, and the texts with which he was very familiar, and that was you know Judaism at the time. And so there was this, reform that was going on that Zarathustra was doing. He saw 
various problems existing in the society and then gave basically a new message, which is what all kind of religious innovators and reformers do. They see problems and they introduce a new system or a new, um, a new way of looking at the world um, to, try to, to try to introduce a new, a new way of life to replace or, uh, or just reform that previous way of life. And just as with all religions, the, the progress of this followed a, a predictable um, trajectory, because just like with all religions, it basically was used at various times for you know, despotic purposes. So when the Sasanians um, reintroduced the religion in the third century AD, there was a uh, a priest that kind of seems like the eminence grise of all of these Persian emperors, who um, who probably was the guy that, that was influencing behind the scenes, influencing things behind the scenes, and really pushing to get Zoroastrianism to be like the state religion. And once that happened, it basically created a you know a kind of Orwellian totalitarian thought control system where you had to believe the official religion. And this is what everyone thinks about theocracies today, right? Where you you live in this like a uh, theocratic totalitarian system where you have to believe certain religious precepts. It's not just that you, you're free to practice your religion and, um, and there are certain laws that you have to follow. No, you have to believe this and you have to, you have to follow this, uh, this religion. So, and it, of course you have after Cyrus, the great, um, he, I, I think it was two, two rulers after Cyrus, Darius, the second, um, who, also was a, a Zoroastrian and introduced um, Zoroastrianism. This was like 600, 600 or more years before that, probably 700, 800 years before that, before the Sasanians. Um, he kind of did a similar thing. So using the religion uh, for violent purposes, for takeovers, you know, it b basically became a political system, a religion associated with a political system. So that seems to happen to every, every religion, even if they don't start out with that intention. It's just the way things go. But, um, as we discussed last week, there are, if we look at the legacy of Zoroastrianism and the, the, thought, the thoughts and concepts and ideas that have traced back and, um, or traced forward and become part of our culture today, I want to just list a few things that, a few religious ideas and even just wider cultural ones that we probably wouldn't have without Zar uh, Zarathustra. This is the idea of world ages, that the, the world progresses and declines, and there are like these uh, um, just either cycles or progressions. So you can basically divide, the, the, divide history into chunks of thousands of years. So in the Zoroastrian tradition, it's a 12,000-year it's a cycle with 3,000-year uh, intervals in between it. The idea of angels. Before Zoroastrianism, there um, specifically, I'm thinking in the in the Judaic traditions, there weren't angels. But once we have the influence of Zoroastrianism in the religion, all of a sudden we have the names of angels. We have all of these characters showing up in later books of the Old Testament and in books like the Book of Enoch. And not only just the idea of angels and naming the angels and worshiping angels, but the depiction of angels as these winged beings. That was Zoroastrianism. If you look at the, the graphic for our show last week, you see a, an image of Ahura Mazda, and it's the, you know, the circle with the wings, and, the, and he's in the middle. And those wings are one of those earliest depictions of angels. So the reason we picture angels with wings is probably, again, because of Zoroastrianism. Also, the idea of the resurrection of the dead, that didn't come from Judaism, that came from Zoroastrianism, got imported in. Um, the idea of a final judgment with fire and brimstone, mm -hmm. Zoroastrianism. Um, the idea of a, of a Messiah to come that would set things right, that was called the, I believe, the, the Saushyant in Zoroastrianism, again, from Zarathustra. The idea of heaven as a paradise. Well, paradise meant garden in these old languages. So um, heaven is paradise. The, the idea of this idea of heaven, this image of heaven comes from Zoroastrianism. And final, just the, finally, just the ideas of, uh, well, certain ideas of life after death. Um, if you look at the, uh, look at the early, the early ideas of life after death or what happens after you die in the Bible, for instance, you basically go to Sheol, which is this dreary place and nothing really happens. The idea of an actual life after death, um, was again, probably one of these Zoroastrian, 
um, innovations. And, and then, sorry, that wasn't the final one. The last one is the idea of the devil. So again, in the Bible, the figure of the devil doesn't really figure in too prominently in the in most of the books of the Bible. It's just you have the, um, I mean, you have the serpent, the serpent in the the origin stories in Genesis, um, in the Garden of Eden. But the it's not really a, a f he the the serpent hadn't taken on the identity as Satan or as the devil until the Christian era. But with later books of the Bible, again, you get imported this idea of this kind of evil force at odds with God. And that, too, was comes from um, Angra Mainyu, or Ahriman, who was the, the opposer and the, 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 the force at odds with the good in the world. So we had the, the truth and the lie, and Ahriman was the representative of the lie. So those are just some of the kind of foundational ideas that we that are just so common today in just either pop culture or religious culture that we may not realize have been around for longer than the religions and the cultures that um, that have those ideas today. So I just wanted to give that as a little, a, a bit more of the background behind and uh, behind Zoroastrianism and how it has influenced us today. Well, as you said all that, I'm reminded about uh, the virtues of uh, this religion, and that is that it has built in a almost full cosmology that's been manifested through all of these other great world religions today. When we uh, did the show some months back on the afterlife, there is in that material a great amount of information suggesting a hierarchy of spiritual understanding and power. Uh, and this material also affirms that hierarchy. It affirms the idea that there is, for lack of a better word, uh, a war, uh, a fight that each man, woman, and child, whether we realize it or not, are a part of. And again and again, in Zoroaster's material, there is this uh, beseeching this uh, call to duty uh, and responsibility in becoming a manifest force for good for oneself, for one's tribe, and even for the world at large. Uh, so this is a quote which uh, speaks to that a little bit. And this is, I believe it's from this book, which we also discussed last week. It's set of guests when Zarathustra spoke, which we'll have a link to in the article. In the famous Gatha of the Choice, the individual is urged to, to choose for himself either the path of Asha or the path of drug. And just a word about drug, which uh, in this material is synonymous with um, lying and uh, the debasing moral choices that men make in service to their own gratification and, and wealth and power. Um, there was a time prior to Zoroastroism that individuals would take a drug in a ritual that he saw as a kind of an abuse, a personal abuse that uh, people were indulging in. So he sought to, in one of his reforms, take that out of the equation. And so the drug is both this literal and metaphoric representation of those things uh, that he saw among his people that were debasing them. Is that, I'm not sure about that. Was that actually, because the word drug, I just assume that was, that's just a coincidence that it happens to be the same word as our modern drug. But the, like the idea is valid about the, um, about the practice that he, that he was against, uh, because in, in the Indian tradition, it was Soma and in the, um, the, which was a plant that they, um, that seems might have been mind altering in some degree, um, kind of like ayahuasca maybe, or, mm -hmm. but, and then in the Iranian tradition, it was, uh, Sayoma, I believe. Hi yeah. Hyoma. Yeah. And, but, but the word, the word drug itself, I'm not sure if there was any intention behind that one being, um, like, uh, in our, in our current language, like in English, I'm not sure if the word traces to, to English in the same way. 
Did, did you read that somewhere? Or I'm, not, I'm just curious. I thought I read that in okay. when Zarathustra spoke. It might have been in one of the other books okay. that there was an abuse of yeah, this, for this, sure. this drug. Of the Hauma. I, I might be conflating uh, th- this idea of the metaphor of drug as lie with the mm. literal overdoing of mm. the drug. At the very least, it's a it's an enli- it's a it's an interesting coincidence that uh, that not only was Zarathustra against the the use of this drug, but that the the word he used for the lie because that was the word in the language was drug or or drug or lie. Yes, and just uh, continuing on that quote, this is uh, a statement he makes: "Hear with your ears the highest truths I preach, and with illumined minds weigh them with care." before you choose which of two paths to tread, deciding man by man, each one for each. And the comment is that the prophet is here urging all those who receive his message to judge for themselves, without clerical intermediary, the truth of his teaching. Just as the two primal beings each made a deliberate choice, so must every man choose freely and without priestly intervention between good and evil in this life. Zarathustra is believed to have been the first to teach that each individual must bear the responsibility for the fate of his own soul, as well as sharing in the responsibility for the fate of the world. And again and again, this, this theme of taking personal responsibility, of seeing this battle as an individual one where human beings are a part of the cosmology. They are, if not angels, uh, then agents of angels on earth, but only if they can see that and make the choice to, to be that manifestation. And uh, that's a crucial idea throughout all of this, which I think, you know, it comes up in the powers and the principalities, which is a an old Christian text and doctrine which gives life and credence to the idea that on a metaphysical level, on a soul level, there are these intelligences or entities or whatever you want to call them that are highly concentrated forces for the lie, forces for evil and selfishness that find their way into influencing not only individuals, but institutions, governments, uh, royalties, the priestly class. And it's a reality just as much as the reality of doing a good deed for a neighbor on this physical plane. So acknowledging these levels of reality in this fight against good and evil can be said to be one of the most valuable parts of Zoroastrianism, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, I <clears throat> just a, a word on the you know on the cosmology that uh, Zoroastrianism has that it it seems to have just sprung so well formed and inspired um, and so stratified in terms of all of the content that it has for determining humanity's place in the cosmos. It's like a, you know, like a general theory of relativity or like a quantum level of theory for the the moral universe and for determining what your place is in the universe and how you should act. And that, it ha- it has numerous levels ranging from, you know, matter to plants and all the way up to the gods and then to the god of truth himself. And it's all imbued with, uh, with virtue and moral significance so that it almost functions as a mnemonic device when you walk around the earth and you see the earth, you see represented in the earth, in the sky, in all of these things, these very clear and very well thought out and very, you know, dare we say progressive, more progressive than progressive uh, values that, um, 
you know, that center around that fundamental dichotomy between truth and lies. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, Ahura Mazda, the creator of the universe, stands as a symbol of truth and is truth. And that truth is a force to be reckoned with in the universe. That it is a force just as important and powerful as gravity, not more important than gravity. That material existence um, is only only owes its existence due to the truth and to the the number of other gods that were brought into existence, the archangels that were brought into existence by Ahura Mazda in order to create the universe. And each one of these gods or archangels, the Amesha Spentas, I believe is what they're they're called. They um, they have a corresponding virtue, whether it's the right order of things, which is you know like the the functioning of the universe. The sun always seems to come back around. The moon always seems to come back around, and things seem to function right. Things work well, and when they're you know in the proper observance of the by this god, when this god this force is furthering their existence, and then there's good thought, and there's good action, and there's rightful dominion, you know, so that there's a, a a way to go about you know ordering your house that is uh that is imbued and rooted in the highest kind of fashioning of the universe so that everything that you do as a human being needs to take place according to objective um, moral criteria that you can also see in the universe around you. So it's very much rooted in the seeking of understanding the the world around you and the organization and conscientious like duty mm -hmm. to replicate that in your own life. And this, you know, over, I think, yeah, it, each one of those gods has a like a physical dimension. But, you know, just as in, and more important than that is that, like I said, that they have that physical dimension, but then when you are living in the world and you are working in the world, you're seeing reflected in the world this this moral criteria. You know, it like it functioning as a device to always remind you that you are part of this great battle that... Um, that in the end will hopefully will lead to the purification and the brilliant existence of all of the the materials and the people and the the spirit that you are that you live with. Mm -hmm. And uh, Zor I'm not sure if it was Zarathustra or just later Zoroastrian tradition that called that um, that goal that end point the which in other contexts we'd call the end of the world the the words they used for it translate as the making wonderful <laughs> which is uh, another light on it you know we, we picture the end of the world as this you know terrible thing with destruction and death and blood but they're not saying that that's the making wonderful is it the goal is to actually raise the raise the current existence up a level to mm -hmm. to have it be something that something that, that it's not right now and Ilan, you mentioned like the power and the principalities and these these gods and Corey, you talked about these these uh, kind of extensions of Ahura Majda and the, like the six forms that uh, that form that group under under Ahura Majda. And there are a couple a couple things I want to say about that and a couple quotes I want to read <clears throat> just on that topic because I, the the Indo Iranian religion that Zarathustra grew up in and the, which he was reforming was a polytheistic one and there were gods that we can see traced down through uh traced back through hindu mythology you, you can see the same names for a lot of these gods and they have kind of like the greek gods they've got like you know the their representations of them who they are what they look like what their personalities are and things like that but zarathustra wasn't having any of that you know he didn't he wanted to get rid of that that way of looking at the the cosmos and that way of looking at the gods um, of course, he was one of the one of well, probably the first introducer of the, a, a monotheistic idea that there is one supreme god and everything else is either underneath or contained within that uh, that supreme god, that one overarching god. So what he did was first to to de demote those previous gods, the divas or the divas down to the level of, uh, you know, what we'd call demons. They were just um, not as high as God. They were actually beings, but not the, not the, the true good 
that they they might have their own agendas they might be part of the lie they might influence people in in negative ways so he demoted them to to demons and the the other class of gods the asuras who were the oh well first of all deva or diva meant celestial one and the other class of gods were the asuras or the ahuras in in uh, avestan who were the lords so what he did is basically he elevated the one lord and demoted the many celestial ones and what ml west says in hymns of zoroaster in the introduction he makes a couple comments on this tendency so overall not just about the gods but about the the actual things in the hymns that Zoroaster composed. He says there is an impressive clarity and simplicity in Zoroaster's religion as it appears in the Gatas. It is not cluttered up with mystical or theological baggage. Its pantheon is not made up of assorted characters from an obscure prehistoric mythology, but of beings with clearly defined identities and properties. Its ethics is plain and straightforward. It is concerned not with irrational rules and taboos, but with easily understood moral and intellectual values. The emphasis is on divine and human sapience, and on man's responsibility for the choices he makes between good and bad. And so what he, what Zarathustra did is, instead of having these gods with their own like personalities as we'd think of human personalities, kind of like in the Greek pantheon, he had these abstract qualities, which were almost personified. So that made it actually really practical, because um, like you, you mentioned some of them already, Corey, he, um, this is what M.L. West writes about these gods. So I'll read the, almost the full paragraph. He says, Zoroaster nowhere identifies the other Ahuras explicitly, the other lords, but we can assume that he is thinking of certain divine entities which he constantly associates with Mazda and sometimes addresses in the vocative. Their names are the names of abstract qualities, mostly of an ethical nature, right, good thought, piety, bounteous will, dominion. These are all things that human beings may have in themselves. So that's the important part, is that these are all things that we can identify in ourselves. These gods are not these um, just remote beings whose wills we, you know, we can't... Um, can't possibly comprehend these are actually principles that we can see in ourselves and which operate in ourselves and that therefore have some kind of practical down-to-earth um, you know quality that we can then work with so um, and and what this relates to or a connection I want to make is that you see the same thing in early Christianity or a very similar thing like the, in Paul's letters, he's constantly almost, if not personifying, things like sin, death, and um, almost, almost to the point where they, where they are these powers. That's why we get this idea of the powers and the principalities from Paul. That they, they are things operative in not only the human body, but the human mind. And this is what, this is what some of the things that we've all been saying so far gets at, is that the this struggle like the battle between the good and the 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 true and the false like the the truth and the lie and between the good and evil it is within every individual and it's it's not our in zoroastrianism it's not our goal and our duty to stamp out the evil in the world outside of us like like darius did with uh, you know in warfare or something like that it really comes down to doing it to, uh, uh, engaging in that battle within and th and that's where these names of these ahuras come in handy is because we can identify these principles we can see that the the, the principles and the um the things they represent are present at all levels so it's present with, uh, within us it's present at the highest level and that there is an alignment that then takes place when we are when we have good thoughts good words and good deeds because we're aligning with something something intangible something higher and intangible. We're getting into alignment with that and out of alignment with something else. Because we can't escape the fact that there are dualities in the world, that there are multiple choices. It's like the life is like a, an extremely complicated multiple choice test, but at any moment we're actually answering, or before us we have multiple questions, multiple, multiple choice questions, and it's just a maze operating in this world. So there are all these choices that we have, and what 
what a thing, what what a what a teaching like Zoroastrianism, I think, was intended to do from the beginning was to provide that path, to provide something, to 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 bring into understanding, well, to make it easier to understand, and then to make it easier to put into practice, because that has to be the purpose of any of any philosophy of any religion is to actually make it practical. Well, how do you actually do that? And then, and what are the goals of that religion or what, or that philosophy? Is it just to, is it just to learn things? Well, what does that mean to, to learn things? Just to know, um, like geography or astronomy or, or the theory of moral emotions. Mm. Well, that won't help you if you, that won't help you in life. Like we, like in our show, like in the two shows we did on stoicism, the, the purpose is to actually have, uh, is to actually put it into practice and, and change yourself somehow. I wanted to just make a comment on the, the battle between the, the, the truth and the lie that you talked about if, you know, a little bit back, Ilan. Mm-hmm. In, um, in Kruacek's book, In Search of Zarathustra, he's talking about, um, he's got a chapter on Nietzsche because, of course, that's where, why a lot of people know the name Zarathustra is from Nietzsche's book. And he points out that Nietzsche kind of saw himself as a reformer of Zarathustra's teaching and setting things right. But then Kroacek argues that, um, that Nietzsche seemed to have actually reinvigorated Zoroastrianism by, by, um, by taking some of those core principles and putting them in, a, in, a, in modern clothes, essentially, well, modern at the time. And so he says that what he, what he thinks Nietzsche saw was that as he put it, Kroacek, the drama, um, like this drama, this, the, this battle between good and evil, between the truth and the lie, must be played out within each individual. The struggle between what a person is and what he or she might become. So this now, listeners to this show and our previous show, Truth Perspective, should, you know, that should be ring, ringing some bells now because <laughs> that's that's... It's central to not only Jordan Peterson, it's central to mm-hmm. Dabrowski, it's central to early Christianity, central to Gurdjieff, this idea of potential and the, the inner struggle to then um, manifest that potential, as opposed to just living like you always have lived, never growing up, never changing, never, never putting the effort into seeing what that potential might be. So that's what he, that's what Karachik thinks that, or says that, uh, is what he gets from Nietzsche's perspective on all of this. And that relates to the Zoroastrian uh, doctrine of two wills. So another thing from, uh, from West here. He describes how they tussle for a man's soul, making their voices heard in his mind, and how his choice between them determines his ultimate fate. So... This is just another way of describing that that battle is within, is that we have, well, essentially, we're not necessarily schizophrenic, but we've got voices in our head, conflicting voices in our head. Well, I think we've all had that before. We, we have conflicting impulses, conflicting drives, convicting aim, or con, uh, conflicting aims. And the, these are personified as these forces operating within and through us. And, and then that, that path, that struggle through that maze then becomes one, uh, an internal one. Well, what, it, it's like the path in your own mind, in your own conscience, which, which path will I take? Wh- which direction will I go? Will I choose, will I go left or right in every situation in, in, uh, in life? And so that's why it, it really is such a, uh, a down to earth and practical religion down to earth in many ways. Like we talked about last week. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we take it for granted, this conception, this framework for good and evil, and seeing ourselves within this framework as individuals. And at its very basic core, he set up this framework for the religions to come. And, you know, you think about Ponderology, you think about uh, Andrew Lobachowski's work, and how he drills down into the science of evil adjusted for political purposes. In his own way, Zoroaster was talking about these very things. He was also getting into it on a spiritual and metaphysical level, of course. But there is, in his words, a kind of indictment against the, the, the priests and the, the organized uh, beliefs at the time that were for all intents and purpose, purposes, a kind of 
a ponderogenical uh, or or ponderological uh, influence on people. So, in addition to the fact that he creates or created this entire framework for these huge religions to follow, uh, to to work from, or to be influenced by, or perhaps you know they took bits and pieces of of all of this to form you know their own religion. Uh, he he drills down quite a bit, and I guess an argument could be made for the fact that these truths that he's espousing are pre-existing. They're in the ether. They're access through the minds of prophets and and people who are wise and people who have given thought and their heart to what is true and what is real uh so there is the the argument that this is just one kind of feeling out and fleshing out of the bigger picture that has a much more important place in western understanding than than we would have realized i guess up until i started reading all this material he, here's just one more thing. Here's a piece on right order. And um, because there is this moralistic framework that he gets into that isn't only a kind of uh, cosmology and, and battle of good and evil. He he does get into a Benjamin Franklin uh, list of, of things and guidelines for living the good life that are no less important. And... Um, this is a little bit also from Setagast's book. In forming his own worldview, Zarathustra seems to have incorporated several other principles of the ancient religion that he once served. Among these was the concept mentioned earlier of a universal right order. Avastan, Asha, Vedic. At once cosmic, liturgical and moral this ordering principle was held to govern every aspect of existence from the rhythms of the cosmos and the workings of nature to the conduct of man in iran the righteous man was ashavan possessing asha an upholder of the right order of things zarathustra himself would claim to have seen into that order vowing quote while i have power and strength I shall teach men to seek the right, Asha, end quote. According to one scholar, Asha is both the principle by which Zoroastrians guide their lives in this world and the basis by which the entire structure of the Zoroastrian faith rests. Quote, the highest value in human life is neither the attainment of happiness nor the achievement of peace, but the incessant work of spreading the ideal of righteousness, Asha. And here he seems to be saying that, and we've talked about this on the show on happiness and suffering and a few other places, we can't become complacent and self-satisfied in those things that would seem to make us happy. That there has to be a striving for moving forward with ourselves, with with being righteous about our lives and the choices we make for the sheer sake of being righteous or appropriate. There's another idea that, uh, that is included in the teachings of the Magi by Zainer. And it would seem to be an idea that Zoroaster borrowed from Aristotle. And it's the idea of the mean, which is just that, one should strive not for excess or even for uh, depletion in a, in a kind of monastic, minimal life sense of the term, but rather for this, a life of balance in the material sense and in the spiritual sense, where you have enough to, to make life good enough to continue doing good, where excesses are exactly what the lie would implore you to pursue. And out of a false sense of humility, you might go in the other direction in the way that, say, a, a, a fakir or a, a monk might go into, although I don't know how good an analogy that is. But the idea was that one should strive for balance and equilibrium in all things. 
And it's not clear in the book if the suggestion is that it might have been directly drawn from Aristotelian thought and teaching. But then again, it might just be one of those ideas that makes sense and is wise. Mm -hmm. And after all, this material is a kind of homage to things that are wise, to the God of wisdom. Yes, in, in that sense, then, <clears throat> it is... Uh I mean, it's there may even be a religion older than it, but it, it is kind of the voice of a of an ancient religion, and a lot of the ideas that we get today, like you listed in the beginning of the show, Harrison. Um, I don't know if you if you've mentioned this, but when you're talking about Asha in right order, I get the uh, the the sense of the the cross that we all must bear, you know, in order to uphold the the right order, to seek out yeah. the right order. That it's not uh, easy being a you know a, just a, a dumb human uh, who's just fumbling around aimlessly most of the time misinformed ill-informed never quite clear what's what's exactly happening as you pointed out this there's always this maze of of choices and of data and of information but the end to to do what you can in that hurricane in that storm in order to uphold righteousness is the the cross is that's a that's a heavy cross that that everyone has to bear and it's this um all of these elements um, combined, they they all combine so well, and they find such a an appropriate amount of attention due to them in Zoroastrianism, which is what I think makes it such such an interesting moral framework that Nietzsche himself, after he seen that the you know God was dead, thought that maybe Zarathustra is our last chance to to, to reinvigorate him. Well, that reminded me of, or yeah, it reminded me of one more quote from. Uh, from West's book, where he's talking about another of the of the six kind of extensions or sons of Ahura Mazda, one of the lords, Dominion. So West writes, Dominion is again a property of Ahura Mazda, as well as being something that humans aspire to. Mazda's dominion, however, is not total and, and is not total and absolute. It is represented as something that mankind must fight to promote. It is strengthened, and he is increased when they follow piety and good thought to the other um, Ahuras. It is a striking feature of Zoroaster's religion that his Ahuras and their antagonists, the Daivas, do not live in a separate world and are not self-sufficient. They operate on earth through their human adherence, and the extent of their power and authority depends on their success in getting people to listen to them. So I just wanted to include that as uh, just more context for that idea to, or a context in which to place that idea of the cross, mm -hmm. is that the these these divas and these ahuras are operating through our thoughts. You know, whenever we have when, whenever we have a thought that um, that might be that oh well, we can just be lazy today, or you have a like a malevolent thought about another person. Well, again, that's one of those branching off points. That's one of those choices you have to make whether to identify with that thought and then manifest it in your action or in your words or to kind of reject that thought and be like no uh i i choose not to identify with that thought and i'm going to do the opposite kind of like george george costanza in that one seinfeld episode you just do the opposite of what you regularly do and your life will turn around <laughs> in miraculous ways so uh there's a lot of wisdom in uh, george costanza but um maybe as a final um, as a final topic for today's show, I want to talk about just a couple more correspondences with the later Christian tra Christian tradition in uh, the, the letters of Paul, which are the earliest Christian documents. And, well, you can see one already with that idea of dominion, um, kingdom of God, the empire of God. There are many more, though, um, one of which is comes back to the fact that Zarathustra was actually a, uh, a poet, a poet and a prophet. The hymns that he wrote, um, West argues, are, were written in order to be recited and uh, performed essentially in front of his congregation, in front of his communities. So these hymns were probably sung or chanted or simply recited by Zarathustra to his people. And that's the poet element of him. But there's also the prophet element, and in in 
in the language, there's this word, and there's this word in the Zoroastrian tradi tradition. Um, I can't remember what the actual Avestan word is, but it basically comes down to us as mantra, or the holy utterance. And so what the prophet was, what Zarathustra was, was someone who hears the holy utterance and then speaks it. So he essentially speaks the word of God. And that's what a prophet is. And that directly relates to, of course, well, all other prophetic traditions, but specifically prophecy as presented in, as presented in and as um, just underlying the, the writings of Paul. Because there is this idea, Paul himself, he, he presents himself as a prophet, one who hears the voice of the Lord and who, who presents it. That in his communities, the, the, community that he, the communities that he formed, they are vehicles for the word of God, for the, the, what he calls best translated as faith's heard thing. The thing that, uh, the th well, that's probably, it's an awkward phrase, but it's the best way to translate it. Faith's heard thing. The prophetic word. And um, so just like with, Zar with Zarathustra, the, the holy utterance is something that is heard within that comes from that higher source, from God, from Ahura Mazda in Zoroastrianism. And it's God who speaks through mortals. So when mortals speak the truth, mm -hmm. you can argue that speaking the truth is speaking, um, speaking God's word. In, in, in the framework of these two traditions. And not only just through mortals, but through the community. And so you, the, when you have this unified community and they're, and they're speaking the truth to each other, and it, could, and it could be in weird ways like in early Christianity where they're not only are they speaking in tongues, but they're actually engaging in, okay, now I'm going to give prophecy, I'm going to speak prophecy. And that will be, uh, it might be a moral injunction or a, a statement about the way things are. But it was delineated and, and bracketed off from just or ordinary conversation. There was something special about it. And this then, um, this prophetic word, faith's heard thing, was then a, or what it did was it provided a direction for behavior and the power to see it through, the power to get it done. That, that's what um, Timothy Ashworth says in his book, Paul's Necessary Sin, which we'll be discussing next week probably. So, for this can also relate back to, to, to just to give a framework for how, how Paul was thinking about these things. This gets back to our Stoicism show on the spirit, on the pneuma, the, the pneuma. That the, it's actually the, through the spirit that the prophetic word comes into us. You know, I don't know if it comes through our ears or through, you know, through our crown chakra, but uh, somehow this spirit comes into us and but it needs to be um, it needs to be digested. Like there needs to be a, a soil in which it can grow, and that well, we'll get into some of that stuff probably next week. But um, the one of the important things in the Christian setting is not only the the prophetic word, hearing the word of God, because anyone can claim or convince themselves that they're hearing the word of God. But the there, there's a, a another concept, related concept to to that thing, and that is the obedience of faith, that when the truth is spoken, when there is, when there is a message from above, you could say, there's then the, the correlative um, principle of obedience to that word, which is actually putting it into practice. So if you get a moral injunction from on high, you, you, can, you can be a scholar, an academic, and write down, oh, this was the, the moral injunction from on high. But if you don't put it into practice, you, don't, you can know that, but if you don't actually do it, then what's the point? So that was the that that's what Paul, in particular, and I would I would think Zarathustra too. That was his aim. That was his mission to get act, to get people to actually put it into practice. And the way that um, the way Ashworth describes it as is as responsive hearing. So not only do you hear, but you respond to what you're hearing by putting it into action. And through that through that hearing of the word and the, um, like the change that happens within through the um, reception of the spirit, that is what gives clear guidance for right and wrong. So all these things are, are put together is, is the, it, well, it is the voice of conscience in a sense that, that comes from within. And that is kind of, that is, well, the goal, I think, in at least in the early Christian tradition, not in the way that these ideas 
later developed in late, with later Christian theologians and practices. But in the in those ori- those original Christian communities, the idea was um, to receive that word and for it to have a life changing effect um, on your actual behavior and the way you the way what you manifest in the world. And so I just see. I see Zoroastrianism and uh, the the letters of Paul and the ideas behind them as just so similar that it's uh, it's pretty striking at times. Um, just a a kind of w- one that might not be as important practically, but which is still interesting is the focus on light. So for Zarathustra, the light was very important. The it was kind of the the expression of um, of of God, really. And, well, let me just refresh my memory on something about light in uh, in Zarathustra's hymns. This is, again, from M.L. West. So how does he describe it? Yeah, so the activities of the two Ahura's right and good thought um, are associated with daylight and the sun. So the daylight and the sun are actually manifestations of those two things. So sunlight was very important. Um, West writes that Frau, Schau, Frau Schaustra, one of Zoroaster's friends, is said to expose his body to the good religion, as if to the sunlight, because sunlight was so important. Um, so I don't know, maybe he was a sun gazer. Mm-hmm. But, uh, well, finally, maybe just one last thing, um, one last practical thing that, that I hadn't mentioned yet when I was talking about how just how down-to-earth Zoro, uh, Zoroastrianism is, is that uh, it's not all morality and just um, you know religious ideas and all that stuff, but it it uh, it gets really practical to the level where for Zarathustra it was important to have good health, and what is often translated as immor- immortality in um, in translations of his hymns is actually simply long life. So to act to, to Try to be healthy, to live a long life, so that you can do what needs to be done. I think that there also is, uh, in the hymns, some mention of enjoying festivities Mm -hmm. with one's community, having a certain amount of joy. So this wasn't an oppressive uh, person who didn't consider the, the need to experience joy with one's community, and when I read that, I thought, oh, oh wonderful. That's, uh, there is a place for, for karaoke in, uh, in, in ancient Persia mm-hmm. and uh, enjoying a nice meal and perhaps dancing and doing the types of things that would bond the community together uh, in their faith, in their connections with one another as individuals. And very human, very basic, very uh, insightful. Well, yeah, if you, um, you know, if we can, we can trust the traditions and the information that we have about uh, Zoroaster. He was an individual who was trained from the, the a very young age in, according to Indo-Iranian uh, traditions, um, taken at a young age and, uh, and taught basically to wrestle with religious ideas and to really learn the rituals of the tribe and to understand the cosmology of the gods and how they all fit into place. And at this time, according to tradition, he was also um, witnessing the, you know, the corruption of, you know, the world around him, the corruption of rulers, the corruption of, you know, nomadic bands, the corruption of the priests themselves, and the corrupt religious practices. And when you read the Gattas, one of, you know, there's there so many translations because it's, like you said, Harrison, it's a lost language, you know, you, but what you take away from it is a man who is pleading for humanity, mm-hmm. who's just pleading because there's nothing that that he can do, but he knows the truth in his heart. And I think it's in the Psalms that they say the, the prayer of a righteous man is effective. You know, there's, there's something about that righteous heart praying and yearning for the betterment of his people and for the betterment of all of life that comes through that it's so, it's so pure and it's so, um, 
it's it's it just it, you can almost hear him just kind of coming out of the pages to you yes you you can hear this the desire the to end all of the madness to end to end the intoxication and the to end all of the the bloodshed and the corruption and and everything that wastes all of the potential of life the meaninglessness uh, uh, and how evil has spread and just seems to continue to spread there's there's some something so pure about this this priest you know this uh, for what what we can tell is probably not you know he didn't have a band of warriors i think he only converted one person up until um you know according to tradition he was in his his 30s or 40s when he started to convert more people but somebody who was absolutely weak and defenseless in the face of a terrifying reality and yet because of his prayer and effort um really changed the the fate of the world in many ways good place to end it i'll just say that i forgot to make the connection with light uh to christianity of course it's god's glory and mm -hmm. uh paul is always talking about glory in uh in his letters so that was the connection there but with that said thanks for tuning in and we hope you enjoyed it make sure to like and subscribe if you like what you heard and want to hear more and we will see you next week